Okay, good morning and uh, good afternoon to everyone. I'm uh, Meredith Malone, the Associate Curator at the Mildred Lane Kemper Art Museum at Washington University in St. Louis. I am uh, live streaming this morning from my office um, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to our speaker today, Alexander Albero. He is the Virginia Blodell Wright Professor of Modern and Contemporary Art History at Barnard College and Columbia University. And he's joining us today from New York to give us his lecture titled, Activating the Spectator by Reshaping the Aesthetic Field, Op, Kinetic, and Participatory Art in South America, 1959 to 1965. Alex has done foundational work in the history and historiography of conceptual art, institutional critique, and Latin American art. His anthologies, edited volumes, and books are essential reading for scholars of contemporary art, artists working with conceptually based art practices, and anyone interested in art of the 1960s, 1970s through contemporary. In 1999, he co-edited Conceptual Art, a Critical Anthology, and edited the volume Two-Way Mirror Power, selected writings by Dan Graham on his art, both published by MIT Press. These publications were followed by Recording Conceptual Art in 2001, in which he brought together a collection of unedited interviews conducted by Patricia Norvell with conceptual artists such as Robert Berry, Douglas Hubler, and Saul LeWitt. In 2003, he published Conceptual Art and the Politics of Publicity through MIT Press, a book exploring the origins and legacies of the conceptual art movement, as well as the significant role played by the dealer Seth Siglab. He also co-edited the volume Art After Conceptual Art in 2006, and then embarked on a series of publications exploring institutional critique, including edited volumes on Andrea Fraser's writings and Institutional Critique, an anthology of artist writings from 2009, both published by MIT Press. In 2014, he published an interview with Uruguayan conceptual artist Luis Kamnitzer as part of the Fundación Cisneros' conversation series. Alex's writings have also been published in a broad range of journals and exhibition catalogs, and he's presently completing a book-length study titled The Shape of Contemporary Art, which focuses on the transformation of the infrastructure of contemporary art and the new geography of globalization. He's also the founding editor of the book series Studies on Latin American Art at the University of California Press, which commissions publications of art history and cultural practices emerging from Central and South America, the Caribbean and Latin American diaspora in the 20th and 21st centuries. Today's lecture derives from his 2017 book titled Abstraction in Reverse, The Reconfigured Spectator in Mid 20th Century Latin American Art, published by the University of Chicago Press. In this study, he focuses on the invention of a participatory mode of abstract art in Argentina, Brazil, and Venezuela in the 1940s through the 1960s offering critical analyses of the work of artists, including Jesus Rafael Soto, Julio Leparc, and Legia Clark, among others. Now this lecture was originally supposed to take place in person at the Kemper last spring in coordination with the exhibition that I curated here titled Multiplied Edition Mat in the Transformable Work of Art, 1959 to 1965. That exhibition was open for just a little bit over a month before the Kemper closed in mid-March due to the pandemic and I wanna thank you, Alex, for being willing to shift the format of your lecture to this online platform today. An interest in recalibrating the relationship between the artist, the art object, and the viewer through the addition of movement, duration, and active audience participation, what Alex will be talking about today, was also a defining feature of much of the kinetic art that comprises this exhibition. Edition MAT stands for the Multiplication of Transformable Art and it was established by Swiss artist Daniel Sperry in Paris in 1959. Sperry's aim was to broaden the notion of art and its role in society, producing domestically scaled, relatively affordable multiples that encouraged viewer participation through touch and optical vibration. Participants included an international and a cross-generational network of artists broadly associated with kinetic and op art, including Marcel Duchamp, Joseph Albers, Victor Vessarelli, as well as more then emerging artists such as Dieter Roth and John Tengeli, Le Parc and Soto were living in Paris at that time and they also contributed significantly to Edition Matt. So I am excited to have you here today, Alex, um, and for your offering of an expanded perspective on these international experiments taking place in Europe and in the South American context. I'm also happy to be joined today by Ignacio Sanchez Prado, the Jarvis Thurston and Mona Van Doyen Professor in the Humanities at Washington University in St. Louis. Morning, Ignacio. Uh, 
he teaches Mexican studies in the Department of Romance, Languages and Literatures and the Latin American Studies program and is a recently appointed Dean's Fellow for Intercultural Competence Initiatives. He's published widely on Mexican literary, film and cultural studies, as well as Latin American intellectual history, neoliberal culture and world literature theory. His most recent book in English is titled Strategic Occidentalism on Mexican Fiction, the Neoliberal Book Market and the Question of World Literature, published in 2018. Ignacio and I will kick off the Q&A se section. We are going to act as respondents um, after Alex's lecture before we then open it up to questions from the audience. So I want to encourage all of you in attendance today to participate by asking questions using the Q&A feature um, in Zoom. We would love to hear from all of you and we look forward to answering your questions live. So with that long introduction, Alex, I give the mic over to you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Meredith. Uh, thank you for the nice introduction and thank you for the invitation. I'd also like to thank the Kemper Art Museum. I wish I was there today, uh, but unfortunately, as we all know, uh, it's not possible. Um, and I look forward to the, to the discussion with uh, Professor Sanchez Prado and, and uh, Meredith Malone uh, following my short presentation, which should be about 35 to 40 minutes long. Now, South American artists uh, working in several cities during the mid 20th century altered the nature of modern art. In this critical transformation, artists reimagined art's relation to its public and granted the spectator a more significant role than ever before in the artwork's realization. These developments unfolded in a complex mediation of the form of abstract art, European um, modernist artists such as Theo van Doesburg, Piet Mondrian, Max Bill, and others referred to as concrete art. This type of abstract art resonated in South America in the late 1940s and 1950s as artists with modernist ambitions banished all vestiges of the tropological in the production of art. They sought to eliminate modern art's continued dependence on the figural and to arrive at an understanding of, in a, world, in a word, the literal. Artists in Argentina and Brazil and Venezuela, Uruguay, independently developed a full-fledged understanding of a systematic concrete art in which the literal prevailed over individual figurative expression. The reasons for pursuing the literal varied, but what didn't was the mobilization of the term concrete to refer to a non-idealistic, non-metaphysical aesthetic in which nothing was abstracted. The work of these artists had neither prior association with nature nor any figural or narrative significance. The concrete paintings and sculptures stood for nothing but themselves. South American artists turn to the literal was a turn away from abstraction. For instance, artists such as Rod Rothfuss and Carmelo Arden Quinn argued that the work of painters who pioneered abstract art insofar as it didn't problematize the conventional window frame effect of the rectangular composition still related to the natural world in a figural manner. They saw the rectilinear frame developed in the Renaissance and conceived to function as a window into a fictional three-dimensional space as at odds with their stated attempt to eliminate the illusion of space inherent to the dominant conventions of Western painting. Instead, the artists argued that what they called the broken frame does away once and for all with all illusionistic traces of depth and emphasizes instead the objectness, the literal objectness of painting. The broken frame liberates the conventions of painting from their representational function and brings an end to the fiction of the image in favor of an emphasis on the presence of pure plastic components. South American concrete artists also argued that the irregularly shaped painting prompts artists and viewers alike 
to rethink the perimeter between the virtual space of the art object and the actual space of the exhibition site. The primary object, as a literal element, can at this moment interrelate with the spatial and architectural context and function as an integral component of a whole environment. Here lies one of the contradictions that will characterize much concrete art in this region of the world. The broken frame will at once function as a key tool towards the production of a literal artistic object, purely self-reflexive, beginning and ending in its own, and a hinge to expand the pictorial composition beyond the parameters of the traditional picture plane and into a relationship with the surrounding environment. Many of the artworks of these artists grappled with the problem of the frame, especially the contradictory pulls of a broken or irregular frame staged to create a dramatic confrontation of opposing qualities, such as the expansion into space and the contraction into nothingness. Their iconography featured simple elements applied to flat, neutral backgrounds with an internal structure of form and color establishing the dynamic interplay of pictorial relations. A case in point is the painting that I show you on the screen by the Argentinian artist Thomas Maldonado. This is an untitled seven-sided polygonal of 1945. As you can see, the geometric composition features an off-white monochrome background with a smooth polished surface and neutral brush strokes that are almost invisible if you were up close to it. Obviously, that's not evident on the slide here. Near the center of the expansive sphere, uh, uh, near, near the center of the center of the expansive white field are two geometric elements that look like they come from a mathematics textbook. I can't find the source of these elements, but they look mathematical. One of them is black with four sides of varying length, and the other smaller one forms a red rectangle. The two elements play on each other, as well as in relation to the framing edges of the composition. Together, the two forms within the white field create several angles that produce a dynamic interplay of tensions with the framing edge. The inner forms of the composition float in such a large space that they lose a sense of rationality. Likewise, the red rectangle, as the only regular shape and the only one aligned with the horizontal and vertical axes, seems like a, seems like a misfit. The irregular angles of the frame and black shape have an inevitable resemblance because they seem arbitrary in their tilts and angles. The black shape also resonates with the curious notch in the frame on the left, and especially the section above that notch, which relates in scale to the inner shape. The black and red forms in the off-white field seem to come forward towards the viewer, but they're kept in check, and the warm browns of the trim of the frame flatten the whole composition once again. The result is one of indeterminacy, the composition is thus locked in a definite though tenuous state, at once expanding and contracting yet complete in and of itself. South American concrete artists also developed the form of what they referred to as the coplanal. This consisted of a thorough re-examination of the picture or cutout frame. Initially, this reconsideration resulted in compositions that physically separated geometric forms in space. The cutout forms each had their own shape and color. The composition held irregular frames together from behind by thin metal bars or rods without being contained in a frame of any type. Then the artists eliminated those bars and incorporated the space between the geometric forms into the heart of the composition as a constitutive element. They related positive and negative to each other through mathematical proportions and color combinations and kept them on a single level plane. This is what the artists described as the coplanal arrangement. Ultimately, the materiality of the coplanal resolves the conceptual obstacle presented by abstract painting, since it effectively eliminates all traces of figural representation by reducing art to its most objective, most literal elements. J. 
Just as the coplanals seem to vindicate the medium of painting, it also seemed to bring it to a logical conclusion. Argentinian artist Alberto Molenberg's Funcion Blanca that I show you on the screen is an open stru structure composed of three irregular elements separated from each other in fixed relationships and connected to the wall. The negative shapes belong to the ground. A smooth coat of white enamel paint covers the three blocks of plywood. The formal relationship of the three white monochrome panels initially seems random, but the panels are in fact structured by an array of edges that correlate across the empty space. Certain edges echo, parallel, or intersect one another in complex ways, but these relationships are only between the forms themselves and don't involve a frame. The composition's monochrome whiteness, together with the dynamism of the expanding compositional lines, leads the eye to the surrounding space, with the inevitable result of integrating art with architecture and ultimately with design and opening it to the spectator's experience. So concrete arts shift from the figural to the literal, from representation to presentation, from painting to material object, transforms the beholder from a passive recipient of a fictional image into an active participant in making sense of the literal elements of the composition. It renders the question of what the art object's informational and symbolic meanings are moot and gives priority to the importance of a third meaning, namely what the viewer sees and interprets in his or her engagement with the literal object and its surrounding environment. This introduces a concept of artistic signification that assumes that meaning is something that one can only produce in the site where the art object and the spectator meet, where subject and object come together. I call the site of intersection the aesthetic field of the artwork, defining it first and foremost as an area of possibility through which the spectator can construct meaning and for a greater elaboration of the artistic field, aesthetic field, I send you to my book, Abstraction and Reverse. By reshaping the aesthetic field to posit the spectator, not as a disembodied receptor of optical stimuli, but as an active subject engaged in a new kind of attentiveness and tactile encounter, South American artists in the mid 20th century open the way for new modes of consciousness and experience, as well as new models of subject-object relations. They produced artworks that challenged prevailing notions of the interconnection between subject and world, perceiver and perceived, objective reality, and subjective experience. In this new conceptualization, art was no longer considered entirely autonomous and internally coherent, but relationally dynamic prompting the imaginative engagement now of the spectator and producing meaning through this very relationality. The rationales underlying the generation of this art varied, as did the degrees and conditions of subjective agency that this art actualized, but the new interactive art forms fundamentally reconfigured the aesthetic field and modernist spectatorship more generally. Venezuelan artists Jesus Soto's early 1950s canvases worked with systematic, system, sis, systematic repetition of simple geometric forms or literal elements in light and dark colors on a flat surface. Soto developed a vocabulary of serially ordered elements rather than compose his paintings through intuitive processes or notions of balance. He constructed them following a predetermined serial order. The serial principle characterizes works such as the two I show you on the screen, Serial Painting and Untitled Study for a Series, both from 1952-1953, which as you can see, consists of identical modular units reduced to standardized forms and repeated across the canvas. Philosophically, the pictorial structure extends in all directions to infinity. Repetition as an order that, like the grid, an artist can repeat endlessly with each fragment equal to the whole, obliterates composition. The juggling of these simple geometric patterns or rectangles and square of rectangles and squares could construct pictures 
without really composing at all. These experiments with seriality soon led Soto to focus on the relationship between space and time. To do this, he reduced the size of the art object in the design and placed small quadrangles of white color in straight horizontal or vertical lines with the addition of fine exterior lines placed circularly, circularly around them, giving a sense of a rotating movement to those cubes or those squares, that, those small white squares that are organized grid form on the surface of the composition. As you can see, the thin black lines of rotation of 1952 on the screen are placed one at a time on each of the four sides of those small white forms, giving each of those tiny squares a sense of rotating on their axes. If you go from one to the next to the next, they, they're, they're moving. There's a sense, there's a, a perceived sense of movement. The rotations and progressions that formed the groundwork of Soto's serial paintings led to the production of artworks that, though presented on a single flat plane, pushed the logic further to create a situation of depth through superimposition of what the artist described as two vibrations, two repetitions, and superimposed progressions. These superimpositions gave the forms an illusion of movement. Metamorphosis, for instance, which I show you on the screen, is based on a grid of small squares inscribed on a plexiglass surface extending forward from the ground and placed at an angle over another grid of the same composition. The overlapping at a slight angle of identically patterned planes produces not only different densities, unequal concentrations of dots, and ultimately masses of different positions, but also a distinct vibratory effect. The way this works is that the optical interference between two elements releases a third element, the vibration, which is literal to the eye, but has no material, visual material, no actual material existence. It was at this moment that another component joined the differentiation of the exhibited object that had thus far characterized Soto's work in the 1950s, namely the increased interaction with the spectator, who would now form part of a new visual situation and fundamentally shift the aesthetic field. Indeed, Soto's work began to take on another level of movement beyond the canvas and dependent on the dynamics of the viewer's physical presence to achieve the visual effect of vibration. Works such as metamorphosis don't move. But when the spectator ambulates in front of this two-layer transparent composition, the dot patterns begin to interact with his or her retina. With the spectator's sideways movement, the square plane closest to the eye seems to float in front of the second deeper plane with enough speed to cause a retinal disturbance. Intangibility becomes tangible and space takes on an element of time. It is important to emphasize that the work incorporates time and space not through the use of a motor, which characterized so much kinetic art, but through the use of the transparent material of plexiglass and the mobility of the spectator. In this way, the kinetic vibratory quality of metamorphosis lies in the agency of the individual viewer. The effect of movement in the work depends on the essential physical movement of each viewer's body in front of the work, parallel to the picture plane. The moving human body, this newly activated spectator participant, completes the action of the work. The vibration in the eye of the spectator that works such as metamorphosis create is more than simply an optical illusion. The optical vibration takes on a literal bodily incorporation as it is the spectator who completes the work through a participatory interaction with the object. So to the spiral relief of 1955 is one of the most striking early examples of this new kinetic art structured by the superimposition of compositional elements capable of lending optical movement to the picture plane. The relief, as you can see, is composed of two spirals, one of which is painted white on a sheet of transparent plexiglass superimposed at a distance of 10 inches or so in front of the other larger spiral painted black on a white wooden surface. 
The superimposed spirals juxtaposed to the intervening black space create a kind of dazzle of continuous vibrations and engender an optical sensation of virtual movement and volume. Spiral relief alters the physical qualities of diverse materials in such a way that they lose their solidity, they lose their volume, they lose their weight through surprisingly simple optical manipulations. Materiality and immateriality come into increased tension. Moreover, when the viewer moves laterally across the work, the lines of the spirals join and separate and the two layers alternately contract and expand. The incessant rippling movement in this work and others like it differs significantly from the type of movement previously obtained by the mere repetition of elements on a flat surface, but it's also of a completely different order than movement obtained by mechanical means. Indeed, an important precedent for spiral relief was rotary glass plates, precision optics, the machine that Marcel Duchamp and, and Man Ray developed in, the 19, in 1920 to produce optical illusions by generating virtual volumes through the superimposition of spinning planes. But whereas this precedent created a sustained illusion, an optical effect that the viewer can observe or neglect without affecting the artwork's operation, Soto's work depends much more radically on the spectator's bodily presence to affect its movement. The work enters a new form of optical relationship with the viewer. That relationship, the significance of the spectator's participation, connects not to interpretation or understanding, but rather to the viewer's physiological and even phenomenological experience. What Soto had discovered was a phenomenon technically known as the moiré effect. This optical effect occurs when two nearly identical sets of lines or dots overlap, but slightly out of alignment. When a space separates the two superimposed sections as one walks in front of them, the shadowy rings expand, merge, disappear, and reappear. The curves and waves move across the structure, upwards and downwards, and the broken line may disintegrate still further, reform, or even disappear altogether if it falls along one of the background lines. For Soto, Moiré offered immense possibilities that went considerably beyond those offered in the anti-subjective total rationalization of the aesthetic that he had developed in the immediately preceding years. With, Soto's, with, with spiral relief, Soto's work protruded further into space. Subsequent works became increasingly complex with multiple extending elements of plexiglass sheets or multiplied patterns layered through superimpositions. This is most evident in compositions such as Double Transparency of 1956. The work relies again on a parallel movement of the spectator's body across the picture plane and its multiple patterns of colored vertical lines that produce an even greater sense of movement. Double Transparency's multiple transparent levels of foreground, middle ground, and background allow for a great deal of vibratory movements depending on the location of the viewer's eye in relation to the piece. Its colored lines of yellow, black, gray, and white further distinguish each element while enhancing their kinetic interactions. The vibratory effects produced by the interaction of various elements within the work and the spectator's own displacement in space generates movement. Unlike the work of, say, Naum Gabo, or Laszlo Moholy Naj, which achieves movement through physical oscillations, in Soto's work, these effects occur on the retina of the spectator. This optical kinetic principle will come to be the point of departure for Soto, as for much kinetic and op art in the following years. The work of Argentinian artist Julio Leparc provides an ex excellent example of this trajectory. Leparc's early 1960s experiments typically took the form of mobile relief sculptures, consisting of sets of thin plastic squares and or metal units with shiny surfaces strung out at regular intervals on nylon threads and suspended in front of a wooden board that was often painted white. Like Alexander Rodchenko's 
hanging wire constructions of the early 1920s or Calder's mobiles of the mid 20th century, the elements of the park's suspended ensembles move in response to air currents, continuously changing the relative position. But the park's 1960s sculptures, a sculpture also expands into the exhibition space, creating an environmental effect by casting shadows and reflections. As light falls on the undulating units, their actual movement projects haphazardly throughout the surrounding walls and their silhouettes and radiations shimmer in space. Here the play is between reality and appearance. The sheets of light resonate like echoes in the exhibition space and vary in shape and intensity according to the position of the beholder and the location of the illumination source. From the spectator's point of view, a work of art made of light seems more immaterial than an opaque image, even though this is obviously not true, since light is just as material a substance as any other. Moreover, a luminous artwork has an intrinsic temporal dimension, simply because it's almost impossible to conceive of light in any but temporal terms, as light isn't a state but a process. Le Parc's mobiles use this vernacular, Le Parc's mobiles thus use vernacular materials, divorced or abstracted from their normal context, and develop a process that occurs in the viewer's own time. Occasionally, a shiny square illuminates brilliantly as it reflects the spotlight directly. Le Parc's exploration of the prospects opened by the combination of transparency, movement, and light led him to a concerted investigation of the various ways in which the mobile relief sculptures relate to human perception. The effect he found is that of a continuity that sets off a discontinuity. The mobiles maintain enough sameness. Sorry about that. Mobiles maintain this enough sameness from one moment to the next for the slight differences to jump the spectator's attention forward and backwards in time. And in this sense, they imitate consciousness and the mind's eye. How do we perceive things? How do we anticipate things? How do we remember things? Not as dramatic scenes, but as projected or retrieved moments. Not in coherent wholes, but in bits and pieces, in fragments. We think in parts more than in wholes. And try as we might to fit those parts together, discontinuities remain. Moments and details keep emerging or coming back to us as the images in their own right, a little different each time as they shift in the mind. The illuminated mobile is the device that Le Parc uses to evoke this process of projection or recollection and instability is the term that he uses to refer to it. Joining together with several artists in 1961 is Grave, Le Parc and his colleagues set out to produce art whose primary aim was to study the physiological relationship between compositions of form on the one hand and the eye of the viewer on the other. The primary reason for taking the pure response of the human eye as a starting point was that the eye is egalitarian. The part played by the eye is common to everyone. It's not esoteric. An art devoid of all emotion and symbolism gives every eye the same sensation, regardless of class or race or gender. This investigation led to the collapse of the distinction between figural space and literal space, led to the collapse of the distinction between the figural space and the literal space of the spectator, and to the production of contingent artworks that place increasing emphasis on the viewer's perception. Le Parc and Grave came to consider the optical instability produced by informational overload as a physiological fact based on the properties of the retina. Instead of seeking ways to stabilize these optical conditions, they worked with them by putting together compositions with multiple vo fo focal points that produce 
a succession of ever differing perceptual conditions and a shifting continuum of sensations. This accentuated the position of the spectator who now had to order the strong pull of each of the different centers of the artwork in relation to his or her position in space. In formal terms, Le Parc's search for visual information that incorporates contextual and temporal aspects, as well as a certain degree of randomness, led him to produce kinetic artworks that mobilize indeterminacy as a fundamental component. These dynamic structures give rise to many conceivable visual possibilities that unfold in the spectator's perception. The multiple possible consolidations of this type of work are equivalent, meaning that there's no correct way in which to integrate a composition. The particularities of perception are always different, contingent on several factors, and each spectator develops his or her own particular interpretation. Le Parc's continuous Lumiere objects typically consist of a light beam projected into a circular unit in which the artists arranged several small sheets of polished aluminum perpendicular to the viewer's perspective. The steady counter rotation of asymmetrical fan blades within the device corrupt the ray of light. The aluminum sheets reflect the projected light and produce an intricate movement of luminous images and courses of light across the surface plane. This accentuates the perceptibility of a light signal in relation to the interference produced by movement. But the full visual effect depends on the motion of the spectator in space in which the art object is installed. When a spectator stands in front of the art object, the lines of light appear to shift across the surface in all directions. But as the spectator moves laterally before the artwork, the fan blades reflect the light beams forward into the space of the room. From this perspective, the artwork extends beyond the viewing subject to include the entire, the entire ensemble of equipment and operation necessary, including the mechanism of projection considered in all of its technical aspects, the room in which the mechanism casts the broken beams of light, as well as the reception side of the artistic apparatus. It's not simply a matter of the art object influencing the spectator, but of a symbiotic relation between the entire apparatus of the artwork and the subjectivity of the spectator in space and time. The turn to action and participation in the context of spectatorship in mid 20th century South American art also marks a shift to an entirely different mode of social engagement. The model of the spectatorship that develops as artists attempt to reintegrate art into its, the social realm by asserting its relationship with the viewing subject turns outward into the third and even fourth dimensions. Many of the artworks in the edition Matt and the transformable work of art exhibition are small scale examples of, of this phenomenon. The gap between the ostensible permanence of the art object and the ephemerality of the spectator's interaction with it narrows and in some cases collapses altogether. Many of these artworks cease to be stationary objects accessible to immediate and exhaustive viewing that is seen in their entirety and invite an embodied reception located in space and time. The art artistic experience becomes a transitional phenomenon, prompting the spectator to relate not only with the object, but also with other viewers and with the surrounding environment. But rather than rest, in the moment of desublimation, artworks produced in this manner, and here I'm speaking more specifically about installations uh, in exhibition spaces than multiples, artworks produced in this manner induce spectators to see themselves both as integral subjects and as objects of the perception of others. This creates new spaces of sociability. Gone is the myth of the singular artist, in absolute control of his or her creative production. Gone too is a traditional understanding of the ontology of art in which the artwork and its conceptualized essence stand apart from the world, unchanging for all time. In place of these singularities, these artworks posit a relational identity, 
and a set of processual operations that are not atavistic but disjointed, having multiple roots, facets, and directions. The subjective agency and creativity of the spectator become paramount in art's realization. Thanks. Okay. Thank you so much, Alex, for that terrific talk and a great lively PowerPoint as well. Um, should I stop this here? Yeah, maybe we should exit the... Yeah. There we go. Um, I would like to throw out maybe one of the first questions. It's sort of a two-part question to go where, where you ended your talk. You, you, you really ended with this gesturing towards this notion that you these larger environments created by Le Park, opening up what you just said are these new spaces of sociability right, among viewers. And I wanted to ask if you could expand a little bit on the implications of this. Like, in what ways did these formal, this kind of formal experimentation relate to maybe to the larger socio-political ideas held by somebody like Le Park, for instance? Um, that's one side of it, to, to anchor it a little bit more in that way. But also, if you could talk, you know, this definitely resonates with a lot of, you know, a bunch of contemporary artists are kind of popping up to mind while I'm, while I'm hearing you talk and seeing these images. If you might have a few thoughts about the legacy of these kinds of experimentations in our um, contemporary moment. Sure. Now, was it just my computer or are you, is your, your voice, the sound was a little off. Is it off? Oh, sorry. Could you a, hear that I, I heard the question. I heard the question. I'll try to repeat a little bit of it in order, but it, there was, there was static, right? Or was it just me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so so Mary, thanks. That's a that's a great question. Uh, the first, there are two questions. The implications, uh, the social implications of uh, more participatory art, and the second question is the legacy of this participatory art into the present, into the contemporary. And you know, let me start with the second question. That you know, the my expertise is really contemporary art. So um, the reason I began this project, this exploration, was that. Um, I actually began it in the in the a long time ago now in the 1990s, um, and it was because at that moment there were, there was a, a championing of artists like Olafur Elias and so many relational aesthetic artists who were talking about the this this new revolutionary uh, um, movement that was now producing art that was uh, constructing relations with spectators in immersive spaces. Um, I mean, generally, uh, you know, there, there are variations of this, but generally that was the sense that um, uh, Nicolas Bourriot and others uh, were maintaining at the time. And I, and I, I in, in the little bit that I knew about Latin American art at that time, and I, I went to Latin American art because of my uh, uh, interest in, and, and research in conce um, conceptual art, um, revealed to me that there was a lot of relationality um, that was taking place within the context of our artistic practices in South America in the post Second World War period. Um, I started initially with the neo concrete artists such as Ligia Clark and Elio Etisica, but this led me naturally back to um, um, some uh, other developments and, and even early to earlier developments. Uh, with the, within the context of a group that was called Madi in, in Argentina and others, and realized that the primary goal of that type of artistic practice was to involve the spectator in an unprecedented way. And the reasons for that primary goal, which brings me to the first part of the, of the question that you asked, is that there was a belief already in the late 1940s that to involve the spectator more in the cultural production was a social political practice in and of itself. This was the, you know, I have tried to locate the Brechtian dimension uh, within the context of some of these discussions. I, I, I'm not convinced that that's what, that, that there was an explicit correlation between Brecht's notion of breaking the fourth wall and the, what the developments that were taking place in Latin America in the late 1940s and 50s. But the, what, the, what I am convinced about is that there was certainly a legacy of that 
playing out. And it was mostly being it played out very interestingly. I wasn't able to really include this in my research, in my book uh, on abstraction and reverse, because it was a little bit tangential to what I was doing. But there, what was going on was that there were a lot of Jewish emigres arriving into South America during the late 1930s and 1940s and bringing these ideas from Germany, from France, from uh, uh, places around the, uh, Europe and North Africa to a lot of the discussions that were um, already in place in, in places like Argentina and Uruguay and, and uh, Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, et cetera. So what's interesting is that the, the, the social dynamics of participation that one finds in early to mid 20th century uh, uh, um, aesthetic theory, such as that of Bertolt Brecht or even Walter Benjamin, if you wanted to do that, um, is, is very much present in late 1940s South American uh, urban cosmopolitan discussions. And so um, the, these artists really were convinced um, that they, what they were producing was an art that was socially progressive and that uh, would uh, um, generate viewing subjects that would be much more um, involved in their social context. It would encourage viewing subjects to be much more involved in their social context, uh, in counter to uh, that type of work that was static and assumed that the spectator was just going to look and observe at what was presented to that spectator. So in short, it's a kind of breaking down of the fourth wall. And that breaking down of the fourth wall is something that I would argue is an enormous uh, component of contemporary art. Then right. th therefore, you know, what I'm tracing, what this is for me is an, is an archeology span of the present. From a particular perspective, of course, there are other trajectories into the present, but this is certainly one of them. It's an, an archeology span of the present that uh, begins to, uh, um, track where the interest in affect, where the interest in a ha a spectator hands-on participation, where the interest in uh, the spectator's own role of meaning construction uh, comes from. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. And that whole, this desire for an immersive experience is something that seems very, you know, of the moment as well. I, I have one other question that sort of piggybacks on what you were doing. So that was great how you, you know, kind of brought us back to the contemporary and showed us your inter you know, where your, your investigations really began. I, in preparing for this event, I, I, you know, I was rereading your book and I was struck by the conclusion of your book and that you talk about and how it relates maybe to your larger body of scholarship. That's where I'm going with this, that the, the book seems to maybe end where your work with like conceptual art began um, in a way. So you talk about the shift. Uh, we were just talking about a continuity between then and now, but I want to talk about, you mentioned the shift by the 1970s. You know, what happens to this sort of utopian notion of participation by the 1970s, where from this type of embodied participation you talk about in Soto's work and in the parts, to this questioning of this critique of ideology and ideological systems that you mentioned in somebody like the Brazilian artist, Sildo Nereles, for this younger generation of artists. I wonder if you could address that a little bit, because that does, it seems to tie back into maybe your, your own broader interests, um, but also if you could say something about you know, what happens to this kind of participation by the 70s, and what does the next generation then do with it? Yeah, yeah, no, that's, a, that's another great question. Thanks, Meredith. Um, the, so let me just, let me, let me lay this out and then answer. Um, what I find in my research uh, in the mid to late 19, uh, my research on mid, mid to late South American art is that they assume that, that they, they presume a certain type of spectator. Um, this, I call it the universal modernist spectator. This is a, they presume that all spectator that there is that there is this thing such as the universal spectator 
and that we just need to find that spectator and communicate with that spectator, but they were humanists, essentially. This was a very much part of the humanist tradition, which I would argue continues within the context of phenomenology and phenomenological thought. When you think of phenomenology, or as phenomenology was laid out, by in this period, the people that people were that the artists were reading was uh, Maurice Merleau Ponty. You have a, a theory of reception that is universal, in other words, it's a body that is engaged with an object or with an environment. Um, but that body is a universal body insofar as it's not gendered, it's not raced, it's not classed, it's, it's a universal, there's no distinction that I've found in Merleau Ponty's writings where he actually says that, you know, different subject positions are going to, you know, receive differently. Um, for him, it's, it's this universal subject, and, and that really was the dominant uh, liberal humanist subject of the, of the mid 20th century. Um, and is the subject that the artists, all of the artists that I spoke about today, in fact, um, have, are assuming. Uh, what happens in, by the 1970s, though, is that there's a there's a that that subject's thrown into crisis for a number of reasons. We don't have that we don't have time to really parse out. But essentially, uh, there's this, there's a growing belief that the subject is constructed by overdetermined factors such as language, if you're a if you're a Lacanian, such as discourse, if you're a Foucaultian, such as uh, um, eco economics, if you wanted to go in the Marxist route. Uh, so, so, you know, there are many different ways that one could, one could uh, um, uh, see where the tr troubling of the humanist subject uh, um, comes in. But what happens is that um, by the 1970s, there's a, a, the, that humanist subject is thrown into crisis. Um, and the, the, um, the, you have a, um, a, an exploration of those uh, um, factors that contribute to the making of a subject, of a self, uh, which I, again, that's something I think still continues to the present. Um, discord, um, uh, performative theory, queer theory, all, you know, the, a lot of ra uh, critical race studies are, are, tr are addressing, decolonial studies are addressing just that, that problem. Um, and so essentially what happens is that by the late 1960s, early 1970s, that universal subject can no longer be maintained without question. And, and you know, these artists then get left behind because that was the subject that they maintained. But you know what, so does abstract expressionism in the US and so does uh, informal in Europe. And you know, that so many, so many artistic movements um, had maintained that human subject, which the artist was traditionally seen as the uh, the channel for that subject, right? The, uh, we um, in the Western society gave the artist um, the role of of presenting for us that human that subject, that that universal self, and therefore, uh, in in, tr in the uh, modernist way of looking at an artwork, um, one is looking at how the subject is uh, that universal subject is is mediating certain conditions. Uh, that I think is thrown into crisis. Uh, um, and therefore, I ended my book there because it really is another whole something else opens up, uh, which is really what I what I think is the the beginnings of the shaping of something that we would call con the contemporary moment uh, within the context of art. It's, it really is also throws the whole modernist uh, model of art into crisis. Thank you for that answer. I, I'm being told my mic is still a little funky, so I'm it is, yeah. throw it over to you. Good. Thank you, Alex. And I'm going to bring the questions to the other end of the temporal and also to Latin America more specifically. Um, one thing that I have been struck with your work on abstraction in general and with your talk is that there is an inherent challenge here to the way in which we think about the Latin American artists and, and their task, right? In generally, Latin American artists have, were tasked by cultural nationalism, you know, populist movements and so on, to explore the specificity of the Latin America and to explore questions of identity, but also to create forms of public art of which muralism is the most widely known uh, form, right? And whenever I, I see your commentaries on Le Park, there is a theory of the spectator that where it is not 
the same spectator that is theorized by David Alfaro Siqueiros or Baraguay Asamin. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how this artist challenged the idea of the spectator in Latin America at the time, and then also the way in which they challenged the idea that people more familiar with the muralists and the nationalist paradigms have what a Latin American artist is supposed to be. Uh, great question. Um, you're, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, and, and I think that you've picked up on something that is obvious too, which is that the art that I was talking about, especially the early, early material, uh, was happening at the same time that the muralist figurative art was at, at, at one of its high points. So that, um, and they, they're, they're antithetical. And the artists consider themselves antithetical. Uh, they, they, you know, they, there was in, in South America, there was a, a figurative mural movement as well um, that uh, was, had a lot of, of, of um, had a lot of support and a lot of uh, um, um, following. Um, and the, the interesting thing is that, um, and, and the reality is that uh, the, much of the art that I just discussed wasn't, on the, wasn't the art that was being processed by a public within the context at that time. It was esoteric. Um, it was not, it, it, the figurative art was, was, was what was seen to be much more uh, accessible. Now, so, so how does this work? I, I should probably say one other thing here, which is that most of the artists that I showed today were members of the Communist Party. So they were left-wing artists, just like the, the artists in Mexico that you mentioned, uh, their fellow travelers in some, some way or another. So what, int and that really fascinated me. How can an artist like say Thomas Maldonado, who I gave a close reading of the work, how, how could you maintain that that is uh, um, a revolutionary, uh, socially engaged art? And, and that fascinated me enough to do some, some you know, research in his, in his writings and his, his archives. Um, and here's how it worked for them. Um, the belief was that, and, and that's why I, I emphasized in my lecture the distinction, tried to overemphasize the distinction between the literal and the figural. The belief was that all, that the figurative by its nature is fiction, is false. Any notion that you could illustrate on a two-dimensional surface, a th any surface depth, whether it's just a simple abstract depth or it's the depth of a window, was a falsity. That was just false. It was it was a deception, and the true artist. And in this case, here's Maldonado. I'm quoting 1948. The true communist artist tells the truth. Tells the truth. The real communist artist tells the truth. The real leftist artist doesn't provide illusions for this public but presents truth facts, fa matters of fact. So therefore, if you, if you eliminate all of the figural from the artwork and, and reduce the artwork to literal objects, you are telling the truth about painting. With, when the painting is a literal object, number one, it's the, it, there's a truth claim. Namely, what you're looking at is what you're looking at. I mean, you'll have this in, in the US context, it's really interesting when to, to look at some of this work that I touched on today and say um, early Frank Stella or some of the some of the works that are taking place in the in the US art context where somebody like Frank Stella in 1951 can say, what you see is what you see in my work. There's nothing else there. But you know, that's what they were saying in the 1940s within the context of some of these works that I showed. It's literal. What you're looking at is what you're looking at. If you want to construct meaning, it comes back to you, spectator, to construct that meaning because I am not presenting to you a fictional window in which the meaning can be found. What I'm doing is giving you some elements through from which you can construct your own meaning uh, um, accordingly. So that, so that that was the argument that they would then level at the muralists, uh, um, mostly coming from Mesoamerica, from Mexico in particular, that 
the, 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 what they would argue is that they're still presenting fictions. And I'm not even talking about fictions of, of indigenismo or things like that. They're presenting fictions of illus illustration, illustr illustrative, illustrative fictions, um, and, and uh, uh, fictions of, of, of figure and ground. And, and what we're doing is presenting truth claims. Uh, Ignacio, what do you think? Uh, that this is this is what they tried to do. This is how they dismissed uh, the the you know a, a, a very credible and very popular uh, um, left wing art practice by trying to maintain uh, um, by trying to make an argument for their art practice. Let me just add one little thing before you answer this. In 1948, I think it is, the Communist Party in Argentina bans these people, Maldonado and all of them, says you you guys are we have nothing to do with you. So, and, and I, I did notice there were some wires, some communiques that had come in from Russia, interestingly. Uh, this is not the kind of art that we want to forward as a communist art. And therefore the artists go off and find their own different ways. Um, Ignacio. No, I mean, this, that is a great uh, answer. I'm not as familiar with the South American debate as I am with the Mexican debate on this part. But it appears that it's a debate of you go piggy, piggybacking on your comments about Merleau-Ponty of universalism versus specificity, right? So there is a form that is also, you know, the narrative of socialist realism coming out of the Soviet Union, of the committed art interested in the representation of the proletariat and the representation of the people, right? And in Latin America sort of combined with the representation of the icons of the nation, which is what Diego Rivera and company were doing. And what you describe in terms of abstraction is more of a creation of a universal subject on the one hand. And also an idea of consciousness that is not about telling you pedagogically what to think or how to participate, but rather creating a cognitive process through which you create your own consciousness. That's, what, that's something that strikes me a lot about Le Parc, for example, that really, it is a, a form that is not, that has, that has the structures of movement and the structures of engagement that allow you as an spectator to reach an abstract consciousness that then I guess would be applicable to, to critical engagement with the world at large. And that is not what the muralists are doing, right? I, and in, in this way, I, another thing that I'm curious, uh, that will be my second and last question before we open to the audience. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about sort of the South American versus Mexican paradigms of art, right? Because it is true that a lot of the representations of Latin American art outside of a Latin America, but a lot of times they favor Mexican artists, maybe sometimes Brazilian, maybe sometimes, you know, individuals who, who are famous, but these artists are working in France and everything, but in contemporary exhibits of Latin American art that are mass, mass addressed, they don't show up as much. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about both why Chile, Argentina, Brazil were places where this developed. And the second part of the question is, why does the notion of Latin American art that is fostered by a lot of uh, mainstream exhibi exhibition not centered on these artists and they really continue? To, I mean, how many exhibits can we have about the, the three Mexican muralists and Frida Kahlo in the past five years, right? And that's the question. How, how can we challenge the way in which um, Latin American art is presented to non-specialized audiences by bringing these artists more into the, the spaces of the museum and public discourse? But you know, the, the, um, these abstract artists, we'll call them that, that I was talking about today, are concrete artists, post-concrete, neo-concrete artists, um, are having quite a bit of a, a run these days in museums, aren't they? I mean, the they're, they're, MoMA, I think, just took down an exhibition called Sur, Sur Moderno. Mm -hmm. um, and and what's, what's happening is also that um, people are discovering that are, you know, throughout the Southern hemisphere of the Americas, including the Caribbean. I don't know where you want to place that, but like somebody like Sandu Darié, there's so many there in Mexico too. There were there were there were plenty of practicing concrete artists, um, and I, you know, it's, it's, I'm I'm getting a lot of 
contacts of people who are wanting to do stuff uh, on on this work following um, you know there, there is a, there's great interest let me just say you're right about the uh, um, about the, um, the 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 championing of those three muralists that you you just mentioned I would love to expand that canon because as you know there were many more than three muralists mm -hmm. in that movement uh, and, and it's always the three figures on the other hand they're very consequential figures and 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 Kahlo as well of course but on the other hand they're, they're consequential figures and uh, um, and the impact of those muralists is huge I just recently I'm teaching a course right now in the 20th century art and uh, the, the Harlem Renaissance was had learned so much from these these figures. The the exchanges are enormous, uh, which and the, so there's a lot of research that still could be done um, for, on the Mexican Muralist movement too. Um, so I guess what am I saying? I'm saying I, I'm hearing you say that the this concrete art isn't as fe isn't featured as quite as much as the art of the Mexican Muralist. Is that right, Ignacio? That's one but also it is not identified. You know, because there's different levels of museums, but a lot of national museums everywhere, a lot of the big city museums really tend to feature figurative Latin American art more frequently than this kind of art. And I think that people have an idea of what Latin American art is because there's an imbalance in representing these two schools. That's mm -hmm. what I was getting at in a way that there's a there's a still work to be done to challenge many perceptions by audiences as to what a Latin American artist should, uh, should I do. To I totally agree. And I think that uh, I, I'm, I'm a huge fan of, of the Mexican muralist movement, but I think that um, one of the things that Mexican muralist movement does is it attempts to talk about some kind of uh, um, indigeneity, right? Some kind of reference back to a past that can be anchored within the context of this case of the, the pre-Columbian world. Uh, and um, the, the thing about the abstract art is that it's much more cosmopolitan. Uh, it's, it's, it's much more fluid back and forth. And uh, um, these artists could be exhibiting, a lot of the artists that I talked about today were exhibiting in Europe uh, equally to, to South America, if not more in Europe than South America. And, and um, there's a relation, you know, um, you, you know, the, the term gutai, Japanese gutai, the gutai movement, gutai's direct translation is concrete. There's a direct relation to Japan here. You know, there's like a direct relationship to, to, to Asia, you've got Europe and the Americas. Uh, there's a, it's, it's, it's cosmopolitan in that sense. And if you take uh, what I suggested earlier, which I, you know, it still needs to be clinched. This is uh, um, something that I found. I would love to read more on this, uh, so which somebody else would write. But you know, the importance of these emigres arriving into South America during the 30s and 40s, and how psychoanalysis was so all of a sudden became so important. How the whole, how the art context, theater, music changes fundamentally at that point. One of the things about Soto, interestingly enough, is that he was a, a very close friend of Pierre Boulez, which fascinates me because Soto was making, when he was broke in Paris in the early 50s, he was bustling and, and he'd show up at a, at a dining restaurant where people were having, at a cafe where people were having drinks at night and he would play guitar with these folk, play these folk songs for that, from, from, you know, that he had learned in Venezuela. But in the daytime, he's going, you know, working with Boulez on serial theory and serial music. And, it's this fabulous folk versus high um, uh, relationship that, that is there that still really needs to be mined. I mean, uh, Boulez was, as you know, incredibly important on, for Dota Kaphonic and, and, and uh, two-tone music. So anyways, that's all, um, that's all to, to say yes. Um, but I'm not sure, that, I, I think that this abstract art is having, um, is having some, traction today um, and and it's wonderful that both are that it's not one at the expense of the other mm -hmm. there are a couple questions from the in the q a um can you hear me okay now yeah perfect now okay um there is one question from constance vale who said thank you for the fascinating presentation uh, she said participation and interaction are obviously challenging at the present what are the opportunities to engage with participatory art or think about interactivity in different ways given our current circumstances well 
the, uh, the current circumstances are not very participatory, are, and if they are, it's dangerous. So, um, yes. Um, so you know, is out. Right now. <laughs> yeah, I, I like to think that these current circumstances are temporary. Uh, so, um, let's let me let me start to answer this by by pointing out one thing, which is that um, when when we looked at uh, for instance, some of the park's works, or even even some of Soto's works that I showed you. When you look at the object that I showed you, if you just look at the material object, that's not the artwork. The artwork is the immersive environment that that material object produces. Because what what is the material object? The material object is is essentially a light reflective motor blade. Um, and and a light that's projected at that motor blade, but those two elements are only a part of the apparatus that makes up the artwork, because the artwork is actually the light that is reflected off of the motor blades that are receiving light from the from the um, uh, uh, from the from the light source, and and not only the light that's reflected off of those motor blades but also the spectator's relationship in that in the space in which that light is reflected so that one of the problems that museums have with a lot of this participatory art that that i'm, I'm describing we could also talk about for instance um uh, Ligia clark's bichos if you know them which you handle with your hands or elio oitisica's capes is parangole one of the problems with a lot of this work or a lot of the works that you've shown in Matt is how do you actually exhibit them? You know, how can they be exhibited? To put these objects in a vitrine is is really that's not what they're, they're not. It's not about objects. It's by the time you get to the late fifties and nineteen sixties, it's about immersive environments. The object is a generate a one component in generating that immersive environment. Um, so museums, I think, still have to figure out how to um, how to um, exhibit this type of work, and and I think that's been one of the problems in um, in, in incorporating this work into exhibitions, and 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 one of the reasons why it hasn't had the kind of reception that one would think it would have, and the problem being that. Uh, um, it's very difficult, short of, I mean, what, what, when, when MoMA had, had the Leisure Clark show recently, they, they made a few mock bichos. And uh, you can play with a couple of mock-ups or whatever you call them, you know, facsimiles. And then the real, the original ones were in, in, in plex, under plexiglass and you can, you can handle uh, the others. But, you know, to put something like that into plexiglass is uh, actually it's fraudulent. That's, that's, that's a sham. I mean, it's really not what that was about. No, and not at all what it was about. So, to, and to give people the experience by making a facsimile, I think that's going part of, I'm attempting to solve the problem that, that I'm addressing here. Um, so, quite apart from post-COVID, in other words, uh, and I don't know the ways around uh, participatory art within the context of COVID. I also like, I really do like to think that COVID is, we're six months uh, away from the end of this or eight months away from the end of this, it might, the sunny side of things. But um, quite apart from that, there still is the real problem on how to exhibit this work. And, you know, that's one of the reasons I would have loved to have been with you in St. Louis to see to see the Kemper show right now, because you're, you're featuring a lot of work. There's that Soto, there's a Soto work there where, you know, it, you, it requires the movement of the spectator in order to understand how the work functions. To look at it just as an object doesn't work. You, now, it's a small scale version, but it still requires movement. I tried to, by the way, to find a video clip online somewhere of uh, capturing that movement. What's interesting about the movement that uh, I was re discussing, which is a, the movement of the spectator laterally across uh, a, a corrugated plane that produces this illusion of, of vibratory movement. Um, what uh, the, the problem is that it doesn't photograph well. It requires two eyes, right? It requires the spectator moving with two eyes. So a still one-eyed version, which is what we get when we go to YouTube, say, or when even when we go to a photograph, doesn't capture the the optical effects that I'm talking about. Um, so how so it's a matter of how to figure out uh, the best ways to to display this constants. Does that begin to answer? I know you 
you can't speak right now, or I don't know if you can, but. I'm sure she agrees, right? Okay, great. <laughs> I have to say, you know, it was a challenge and it, we, we did try to implement some of those kinds of strategies of having, we actually had some students like reinterpret some of the works so that you could actually touch them and things. But you're right, it's a, especially with Edition on Matt, as these are small scale works that were really meant to be bought and brought into the home to be played with directly and have that kind of in, that one on one relationship with these works. And so when they, they kind of that deadening experience, you're right, when they're put under plexiglass, certainly. Um, we have a, a few more questions. Uh, once here, it says, as I look at your examples of participatory art in Latin America, I notice the abstract notion of scale in these pieces. How is the viewer to gain the perspective of a rendering or is this part of the glory of the individual interpreting these works in their own terms? So I guess maybe that's kind of what we're, is it a, a question about how we really understand these works and representations? I'm not sure. Well, let me take a shot at that. Um, so, so scale is obviously crucial because one's moving towards an immersive environment. Um, the initial uh, uh, the initial experiments were smaller scale, but it was very very quickly these artists discovered that they had to that that not just size but scale. By scale, I mean the relationship of the human body to the the artwork composition. The, let's just say the human body within what I was calling. Uh, the aesthetic field. This that that is scale. So it's even more than 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 the size of the work. And you know, as you saw, as you saw with what I was presenting, the artworks over the couple of decades I covered there, I guess it was, um, became larger and larger. So that the 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 multiple which is what the mat exhibition and it's a fabulous exhibition by the way and and there's a whole other paper to be given on multiples here and on the role of multiples and on the political role of multiples the reason for the multiple according to a lot of the artists in the 1960s 50s and 60s was that it would give it would make affordable art objects for many more people than would be able to afford the, you know an art object so it was it was a, a way of making the art object more egalitarian allowing people to buy for a relatively small sum uh, an art a soto or a le park or a, 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 a tangled e or whoever it was that we were talking about here so um the so scale is important and i i think i think what you're picking up on is that at a certain moment i said and here i'm talking about the installations not the works that are exhibited at matt in the lecture i felt the need to put that in because if we're talking about the spectator's immersive uh, sensual sensorial experience with the artwork it doesn't really work if the scale is at, at the multiple level right mm -hmm. and so sp scale okay. is is crucial uh, um, for for the some of some of the key effects that I was uh, attempting to to elaborate on we have one more question that moves a little bit away from the subject of your talk and it has to do with your newest project you're working on um, they said, I'm curious about your current project in progress. What's the relation, if any, between this work you present here today and your current project on the infrastructure of contemporary art in the new geography of globalization? Could you give us a sneak peek? This sounds like the last question to me. Um, <laughs> the, um, so, I, so this project that I'm just finishing up uh, now, it is uh, we're at the footnote stage here. Um, is tracking the globalization of art, essentially. Um, and, you know, first of all, the relationship between what this, this work that I just presented today and, and the current project is that, interestingly, and I think as Ignacio was already touching on, the, um, the interest in global, in art coming from global contexts is a relatively recent phenomenon of the last 20, 30 years. So the shape of contemporary art, which is what I'm calling this new book, tracks the development, uh, the, the I, I call it the um, uh, centrifugal development of the art infrastructure following the end of the Cold War, where in the last 30 years, the whole, we have a global art world. There, it has to be reckoned with. We can no longer do, you know, what was being done when I was trained as an art historian in the late 80s and 90s, uh, which were early 90s, which was 
uh, um, just look at Western Europe and the U.S. and you're and you've covered you've covered all the important bases with a little side side view here and there. Um, to any any um, reflection on contemporary art requires a global perspective, and so. What I'm, what I try to do is I try to do an, another archaeology of, of of that development towards uh, um, and the expansion of the infrastructural uh, uh, framework of of contemporary art uh, of of art uh, to uh, to um, to many contexts beyond the Western Europe and um, and and the U.S. However, in doing that, and I've been working on this project for some time. Uh, in doing that, I discovered that the very notion uh, of what I'm just describing now as an expansion of the art framework to these other places is a highly problematic one because a lot of these other sites have local art histories that are very well developed and are flourishing and have their own tensions and disagreements. And so, so, so then we needed to, I needed to construct several different uh, planes of intersection between uh, um, the uh, uh, this one plane which we could call the global plane, which is uh, the uh, um, post uh, uh, um, Cold War um, Western art framework, and those multiple frameworks that were already there prior to the Cold War that are intersecting. And so, a lot of the, in short, a lot of this new project is talking about the relationship between this. A larger Western model that is powerful because of economic and publicity and many other uh, reasons and issues and factors, uh, the, the relationship between that model and local art contexts, which are, uh, um, are, are just as rich, if not richer than that Western context and have their own uh, uh, limits and, and possibilities and, and how those two meet. So that essentially, that's what I'm doing in a nutshell. It sounds like an ambitious project. Alex, are you going through certain case studies or how, how are you framing the? Oh, okay. Um, so five chapters. Um, yeah, there's a, there is a trajectory. I'm a historian. I'm tracking this thematically, but also historically. Um, the 90s in the first chapter and what happens there um, as um, certain types of exhibitions. A lot of it is exhibition based, by the way. Um, certain types of what I call project shows, project exhibitions develop in the 90s uh, alongside with project artworks, project works. What is a project work? A project work is an artwork that isn't complete in and of itself. It's constantly added to in the process of its exhibition. A project exhibition is the same, an exhibition that isn't complete in and of itself. What, during the duration of the exhibition, there are factors being added and subtracted from it and it's changing for those three months that it's up or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, so the development of that already transforms the modernist model of the artwork or the art exhibition and already begins to uh, introduce a, a lot of uh, a new, new problems, new issues. Uh, the second chapter focuses on uh, Potosi. It focuses on, um, on uh, the, this exhibition that took place uh, um, at the Reina Sofia in, 19, in 2010 on uh, um, Principio Potosi and its legacy where you had these, um, it was a project exhibition that these artists uh, um, based out of Germany and, and Bolivia put together where they were attempting to argue that the Potosi, which was the site of a major silver mountain that these Spanish mined and ran the empire for several centuries with, um, these artists tried to, argue, tried to track the history of modernity through the through the history, through the history of Potosi, and produced an exhibition where they include a lot of Bolivian artists to to process, um, to make artworks that related to to this uh, uh, principle, as well as uh, a lot of international artists. Uh, what interested me was that that exhibition had a major pushback from a decolonial perspective. A lot of local art, art community said, you know, this is yet again the Western model coming in to try to tell us about our history when and, and not and overlooking all the micro details of what's going on and what we're doing. So it, it became a very interesting polemic for me to, to unpack because it tracks what I was saying earlier, uh, this, these, these two worlds that come together in the global, the world of the global, 
um, which could be connected to, you know, a new phase of liberalism, uh, um, to uh, the world of the local, which has its own troubles and possibilities, as I said earlier. So those are two chapters. I can't go through all five chapters, but just to give you a sense of what's going on there. Well, thank you so much, Alex. I think we've, we've reached the end of our time. Um, Ignacio, I wanted to give you an opportunity if you had anything more you wanted to say. Otherwise, I will thank you both for your time Hi. today. Just to thank you to Alex for the wonderful talk and for visiting us virtually and in the hopes that we are going to be able to repeat this in person at some point. I, I would like to do that. I really regret that I can't meet all of you and, and be there uh, to even have a discussion with a bunch of you that are in the audience afterwards, but um, it is what it is. And uh, thank you for the great questions uh, to both Meredith and Ignacio and to the people who ask questions from the audience as well. Uh, and thanks for having me. Bye. Great. Bye. Thank you so much.